And good morning, everyone, and uh, good day and good evening to everyone else uh, not in the European time zone. And welcome to another edition of Disrupt Network's virtual talks on all things crypto and blockchain. Um, as Jan said, my name is Liam. I'm the editorial manager at Crypto Briefing, a crypto specific publication. Today, I'll be joined by five panelists who will offer insight into the core components of crypto wallet infrastructure. As institutional investors turn to digital assets, ensuring safety and reliability is critical for further adoption. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first panelist, Custo Digit. CMO of Custo Digit, Christian Bieri will present, and he'll be discussing Custo Digit, the platform that brings institutional grade custody for cryptocurrencies and tokenized assets to regulated financial organizations. Christian, please take it away. Thank you very much. I share the screen. So very welcome as well from my side. <laughs> Greetings from Zurich. Um, Costa Digit, the Swiss Digital as the, the, the Swiss Digital Assets Bank in the box. Uh, who is Costa Digit? Uh, Costa Digit is a spin-off of Swisscom. Uh, Swisscom, uh, you may know, the major telco provider here in Switzerland, and even more in our today's context, the uh, market leader in outsourcing for banks. So more than 80 banks are operated uh, by Swisscom. And uh, Swisscom as well as our main shareholder. As you mentioned before, our mission, the mission of Costa Digit is bringing investor-grade custody to, for digital assets, so meaning cryptocurrencies, as well as tokenized assets to the regulated financial institutions. Um, at the beginning, when we founded the, the company some months ago, what were the challenges and uh, the, the, the points we wanted to address with our value proposition? So uh, the, uh, our concern or our ambition is to be a trusted uh, custody and trading platform to realize the full potential of digital assets. And mainly we are addressing uh, security concerns since uh, in, in an institutional grade environment security and trust are key. Uh, and for the time being, when we founded the company, traditional uh, market infrastructure providers uh, in the traditional asset space did not have yet an offering for digital assets. And as well, of course, uh, for the seamless integration, we had to build the bridge to the fiat world. Uh, that's why I do then the a deep dive on, on our banking processes. But nevertheless, as well, core banking integration, not only backend, but as well uh, the uh, frontend to ensure a seamless user experience for the end customer. What then are basically the requirements of a custody and trading platform in our view? I'm starting at the very bottom, banking processes. Then Custodigit is targeting institutional clients, meaning banks, asset managers, and exchanges that want to grant access to cryptocurrencies or tokenized assets to their end customers. So uh, in the first step, and one of our core pillars in the platform was to build all the relevant banking processes to enable the bank to uh, optimize their, uh, their, their business. So as an example, we implemented uh, the whole trading functionalities for cryptos, best including best execution, anti-money laundering support as well, out of the box in our solution, settlement functionalities, and as mentioned before, core banking integration uh, and the user interface. This is some, somehow the basic layer in our value proposition. On top, I mentioned uh, Swisscom as, as our operating partner uh, and security as a key requirement. Here we fulfill the requirement with uh, audited operation processes. Uh, the platform is redundant uh, in a tier four data center in a banking grade data center here in Switzerland. Of course, we applied or we uh, implemented Chinese walls in a technical, but as well in, a, in an organizational point of view. Uh, on top and embedded uh, to the whole platform in a holistic uh, security framework, 
not only physical security as well as security on a transactional banking transactional level. So we applied and we got all the certificates required. So ESO A, we audited the key management process and uh, we are taking part of the Swisscom bounty program. So all everything to ensure and to, and to give the trust for our customers and then customer that we are operating the platform in a secure manner. But now getting concrete, how does the uh, platform look like? Um, we offer the platform in a white labeled and uh, deployed mode. So white labeled meaning the, uh, the, the, the platform is uh, appears in the look and feel of, uh, of the customer, so at, at the bank. So the platform can be very easily adapted to the requirements of, of the bank. And uh, on top, you see the API integration layer. So all the connect connectivities required to integrate the platform into uh, existing system landscape in the bank. Again, backend. Uh, the bridge to the fiat world, but as well the front end for the end users or the seamless user inter interaction in a customer portal or in an e-banking system. Then on the very bottom, the secure digital asset storage layer and the integration of the different chains we are supporting. Currently, we are focusing on cryptocurrencies. And uh, in the middle, that's where we see where we really differentiate uh, towards our competitors is we call it the business layer. So all the relevant banking use cases on the left are the custody, uh, on the right, sorry, on the right, uh, the custody use cases with transfer in and transfer out of cryptocurrencies or the digital assets in our platform. And then the sell and buy or the trading related functionalities and the manage managing functionalities for the whole life cycle of digital assets within the platform. So that this is basically the scope, the functional scope we are offering. So we think and we are convinced that uh, with this setup, we answering the challenge we are facing currently with the uh, with, uh, implementing cryptocurrencies for institutional grade uh, financial service providers. So again, banking grade operations with all the relevant certificates, trusted partner, as mentioned before, trust and security, very uh, important and relevant as a, comp a spin-off company of Swisscom and embedded in a leading ecosystem, for example, as well as Deutsche Börse. Banking in a box. So all the banking functionality I just show is live here. It's in production, it's uh, available. And uh, that's why we position ourselves as, as a jumpstart for financial service providers in a SaaS model with short time to market, with minimal front, uh, upfront investment and with minimal uh, uh, running costs. So if a bank or an asset manager wants to uh, grant access to the, his end customers to the digital assets, we are the partner. What we achieved uh, during the last uh, few months, we are now uh, live with Signum. Signum, you may know the first digital asset bank who got the banking license here in Switzerland. So we are in production since, since August of last year. The bank uses the whole functionality of Costa Digit as shown before. Uh, what else did we do? Um, we uh, just completed the proof of concept with Deutsche Börse, Swisscom, uh, Falcon Bank, Fondobel, Zürich Cantonalbank, so three major players here in Switzerland banks, uh, where we did uh, the POC and settled the securities transaction via DLT technology across different blockchains. So these are the achievements of, of the last few months. Yes, Custer Richard, bank in a box. If you we are ready to help, uh, feel free to reach out for, to us and uh, we are happy to discuss your requirements. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Christian. Uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, and we have one question in the WhatsApp group. It mm -hmm. comes from Ilias. And it reads, uh, 
don't you think that there is a conflict of interest when you offer both white label custodial solution and act as a prime broker offering trading and order execution? Yeah, good, good question. Uh, I was not precise enough in this case. We do not offer trading services. We offer the trading functionalities. So we are a pure platform and software provider. We do not uh, interfere to any customer relationships or we do not offer the service. We are a platform and a software uh, provider. Okay, and we have another question and it sounds like Patrick would like to pose this to each speaker. So perhaps uh, in your presentation speakers, you can maybe touch on this at the end, but um, has the complete setup of Custodigit been audited by an independent reviewer? Yes, uh, so we had uh, we have a so-called non-action letter from FINMA, the Swiss uh, regulator, approving or co confirming that our business model and our platform uh, uh, does not need any, any license. So uh, that's uh, approved by FINMA, the regulator. And all the certificates and the audits I mentioned, we uh, did with uh, PwC. No more, uh, no more questions in the, oh, got one more question from, looks like Kay. Uh, how was the experience to integrate compliant AML processes into the application layer? Uh, it, uh, when integrating uh, Custodigi in an existing system landscape uh, regarding AML, AML, it's always the question, what is the leading system? Is it, let's put it that way, the, the traditional AM, um, AML solution, for instance, a core banking systems, or is it uh, Custodigi or even a third party uh, software? Normally, that's the no, this is, this is standard setup we are ex, uh, where we have experience. Normally, the existing core banking system is the leading system for all the KYC and uh, uh, and the documentation of, of the of the KYC. Nevertheless, of course, we integrated uh, chain an analysis tool for the digital asset uh, topic that's integrated in Custody. Okay. Great, thank you, Christian. And I think we'll move on to the next presentation. Uh, unless, did you have anything to add, Christian? No, thank you very much. Thank you for the time. Absolutely. Um, next up, we have uh, the CCO of Bitflyer, Ivars Sukovskis. And if you're not familiar with Bitflyer, it's, uh, it's a top 10 cryptocurrency and digital asset exchange. They're licensed and operating in the United States, Europe, and Japan. Ivars, uh, please take it away. Yeah, thank you, Liam, for the introduction and good morning to everyone from Luxembourg. Uh, give me a second, I'll just launch my presentation in a bit. Okay, so as Liam has already mentioned, yes, we are a cryptocurrency exchange and we have three offices, one in Tokyo, one in San Francisco and one in Luxembourg. Our headquarters is in Japan. Uh, the company was founded in 2014. And currently we are the only exchange uh, globally that has uh, licenses in each, uh, on th basically on three continents everywhere where we operate. So um, in Japan, uh, Bitflyer Incorporated, a Japanese entity is registered and regulated as a virtual currency exchange operator. In US, we hold licenses from 46 states and also including the virtual currency business activity license in the New York state, uh, uh, BIT license. And in Europe, we are licensed as a payment institution and supervised by the CSSF, the local regulator. So we know a bit about regulation. And that's why I'll perhaps take a little bit twist to the today's topic and speak more uh, about the custody services from a regulatory perspective and how do regulators uh, see this obligation and what risks they identify and what are the requirements, at least from the areas where we operate. So first I'll talk about Japan because I think Japan is one of the most advanced countries right now uh, when it comes to uh, certain specific custody requirements for exchanges. So uh, on April 3rd in 2020, uh, the Payment Services Act uh, was amended by the JSA and it introduced three core components to the uh, cryptocurrency regulation landscape. So first, 
they uh, introduced requirements towards development of systems for crypto asset exchange service providers, which is generally addressing the custody of uh, crypto assets. Then um, the second part was measures for CFDs using crypto assets. So uh, again, that spoke about more um, setting up a separate license for uh, CFD businesses when it comes to uh, CFDs on crypto. And the last one was measures for ICOs using crypto assets. But again, for the topic of today's session, I'll speak more about the custody part. So Japan is very specific here. Um, and basically the requirement reads that, first of all, the, there needs to be a specific proportion maintained between customer assets and uh, company assets. Um, no more than 5% of customer assets can uh, maintain uh, in a hot wallet. This is for the smooth operations um, of the exchange for withdrawals and various transactions. Uh, and the rest must be kept in a cold wallet. 5% uh, is for the hot wallets, 5% is the ceiling, is the top. So the less the, the merrier. And at the same time, the exchange itself must also set up a separate um, cold wallet where it needs to deposit its own assets, uh, crypto equivalent, um, to the funds held in a hot wallet. So this is kind of a guarantee from the uh, company side to ensure if anything happens with the hot wallet, if there's uh, any um, hacking incident, which leads to uh, loss of funds from the hot wallet, the company can't compensate from its own funds. And that is on top of various insurances that companies must maintain as well. Um, and also the amendments that were introduced back then came with an obligation and a requirement. And that also, I think, answers one of the questions partially uh, from the audience already before. Uh, that this must be also audited. Uh, so um, the custody and safeguarding of assets, uh, both for fiat and crypto in Japan, must be in scope of the external annual audit. Um, then I'll talk now a little bit about the Luxembourg experience, uh, which I think is far behind Japan so far. Um, in March 25th, this year, uh, Luxembourg government has transposed the uh, Fifth Money Laundering Directive a little bit too late and not in full, um, but it introduced just a few things related to crypto uh, businesses. So first, it gave the definitions for virtual assets, virtual currencies, VASPs, and custodial wallet service providers. Uh, there's nothing novel and new here. It's basically, they took the definitions from the Fifth Money Laundering Directive and a little bit from the FUPT. Uh, FIDAP guidance. Um, and also it introduced a, a vast registration framework where companies that falls uh, under the scope of a definition of a VASP must register themselves with the CSSF. But that is only for the supervision uh, under the AML. So when it comes to asset safeguarding requirements uh, issued by Luxembourg government, uh, there are obviously obligations and requirements related to fiat that the funds not need to be kept in a separate account. They cannot be commingled with operational funds, um, that uh, they need to be kept off balance, etc. But there is nothing about uh, custody of crypto assets, at least nothing public or official put anywhere in the law or legislation. However, uh, upon authorization of companies as payment institutions that do um, crypto exchange activities, CSF issues specific conditions or uh, kind of instructions or guidelines, which it's um, basically mandatory to follow as a supervised entity, even though it is out of their scope of supervision, uh, which relate to, again, uh, custody of crypto assets. And in this case, it's quite similar in some sense to Japan, at least from the proportion side, no more than 5% needs to be kept in hot wallets, 95% must be in cold storage. Uh, but there, it's, it's not as detailed, obviously. So this just relates to proportions, nothing about equivalent uh, cold asset storage of the company. Uh, so as I said, uh, CSSF and Luxembourg is a, bit, a little bit behind from Japan in this sense. And uh, lastly, in US, uh, as far as I'm aware, there's no specific or explicit regulatory obligation stated anywhere, again, for the crypto custody and how this needs to be separated. Um, 
now this needs to be arranged. However, um, in New York, the uh, NYDFS um, has a, a usually sets up a supervisor agreement with licensed entities. And uh, in our case, the obligation is to maintain a ratio of 20 to 80. So no more than 20% can be kept in a hot wallet and uh, the rest must be maintained in a cold wallet. This is um, obviously different from, again, Japan, a bit more relaxed, but um, we, of course, try to maintain the higher industry standards in this case. And lastly, uh, I'll share some uh, predictions for myself, what I sense might be coming in the future when it comes to asset custody and the regulation. So in the following three years, I suspect, uh, given the trend that has been established by the regulators and where things are moving forward, I suspect that uh, at least across the EU, um, the VAS registration framework, which is quite relaxed right now and mostly focuses on anti-money laundering requirements and obligations, will become way more advanced. We already see some more detailed regulation in Malta, uh, the France uh, pact the law also is kind of a bit more sophisticated than everywhere else. But speaking of the example of Luxembourg again, um, it's, uh, as I said, there are way many steps behind um, other international regulators. So what I suspect is that it will become more granular and they will be way more specific about what VASPs need to do and how they need to set up their business. And it will be specific uh, on crypto asset segregation. They will provide travel rule implementation uh, clarifications, some monitoring obligations, etc. So it's not just going to be for anti-money laundering, but it's going to cover a full spectrum of other requirements specific to crypto businesses. And then um, when it comes to crypto asset segregation, again, it's going to be different from asset segregation uh, that we already have in EU. Uh, so it's not going to be just about uh, keeping uh, customer assets separate from um, the company assets. It's not just going to be about uh, ratio between hot and cold wallet. It's also most likely will touch upon various security aspects because this is way different when compared to fiat asset uh, safeguarding. There are other risks, and uh, so obviously, I think these will be factored in the into the regulation. And lastly, um, I, what I suspect is that insurance uh, obligations of crypto assets under custody will also will become a norm or even a requirement by the regulators. Right now, it's quite often used kind of as a sales pitch uh, by companies, and it obviously works pretty well for um, investors to know that their funds not just secure on a cold world storage, but also insured and are protected basically from any hacking events, which have been quite frequent in the past few years. Um, but again, while this is kind of a, just a big bonus for um, uh, investors or um, for customers, I believe that uh, in, in the future, this will just be, become a, an obligation uh, for companies to have an insurance in place, similar to uh, EU where they have the uh, investor protection fund, like or the compensatory fund, which protects the deposits of um, banking clients, for example. So this would be kind of perhaps kind of a twist or equivalent to that framework. Um, so that in case something happens, if there's a hacking event or the company goes bankrupt, the assets are uh, secure. So that's, that's it for me. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you, Ivers. Uh, thank you for the presentation. We do have uh, a question from An Dong Le. Uh, they're curious about decentralized exchanges. Um, what do you think about decentralized exchanges? And do you pl they plan to expand your infrastructure to operate on smart contracts? Uh, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, as far as I'm concerned, as part of our strategy, we do not have any uh, plans to move in that direction for now. Um, I think decentralized exchanges in general are quite a sophisticated topic, especially from the regulatory perspective, like everyone is still figuring out how to properly supervise and regulate them because by, by definition, decentralized means that if there's no central uh, unit operating the exchange. Uh, and that's, that poses the biggest uh, problem for regulators, like who, who needs to be supervised and who's going to be held accountable. Um, 
So I'm, I'm not really sure uh, in which direction this will uh, keep moving and how the regulators will address the thin play exchanges for now. Uh, I think their core focus is just for now uh, to regulate the entities that fall under their supervision and that are operating on their territory. Great. And I just have one question uh, from my end. Why, why do you think Japan is so much more advanced than other regions in the world in terms of cryptocurrencies? Uh, that's, uh, I, I think historically Japan uh, was way more progressive and advanced than many country, uh, countries, especially now. I think they're kind of way ahead of a lot of countries in the world. And being the technologi technological leaders, I think the adoption of cryptocurrencies was kind of more natural, I think. Um, and it kind of happened a bit quicker than um, it started everywhere else. Um, and uh, again, the cryptocurrency exchange business, I think it's, um, it's a bit more sophisticated and more developed in Japan now. Um, therefore, um, the regulators pay more attention to it. And they also had a few incidents uh, before uh, with the Mt. Gox uh, incident and a few hacks that happened. That's why the regulators became very concerned and started to quickly um, design like supervisory frameworks um as of now i think they're quite equivalent to actually kind of banking supervision standards so the requirements are quite high um and i think they have sufficient knowledge within the regulatory teams to be able to design the appropriate regulator framework um which in cases of other uh, countries sometimes is 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 not exactly the same um so I think that could be uh, some of the reasons why. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for that answer. It's, uh, Japan is definitely a very interesting hub of uh, innovation for cryptocurrencies. Uh, let's see if there's another question. OK, yes, because of the Mt. Gox hacks. Yeah, so some people are, some of the viewers are definitely aware. But uh, thank you for your time, uh, and thank you for the presentation, Ivers. And uh, I think we'll move on to our, our next presentation. Um, next up, we have uh, the CEO and co-founder of Fireblocks, Michael Shaulov. Fireblocks is an end-to-end -end custodial service uh, that helps investors safely and securely interact within the crypto ecosystem. Um, Michael, I'll let you take that away. Oh, you're on, you're on mute, Mike. Michael. Okay. Now, I think you guys can hear me, right? Um, so thanks, Liam. Uh, thanks for having me today. Uh, my name is Michael Shalov. I'm the CEO of Fireblocks. Uh, basically, what we provide is a secure digital asset infrastructure. So uh, I'll tell you a bit about, uh, about Fireblocks, where we're at in the market, uh, and uh, which companies we're helping with. And I think I will actually try to focus a bit about how uh, our customers, essentially uh, custodians and banks and financial institutions when they basically enter the space uh, of digital assets, not only that they can provide custody services, but actually how can they sort of enable themselves to generate uh, business and generate more money out of uh, launching those offerings. So the reason why I think we are in a reasonably good position to talk about it is that uh, over the last year since we've launched Fireblocks, we really built a, a very scaled and battle-tested platform that is being used by uh, the majority and the main players in the uh, cryptocurrency ecosystem. Uh, we currently have over 60 institutional clients that are using our infrastructure. And in the last 30 days, we actually transferred over $9 billion of digital assets that the uh, flowed uh, through our infrastructure and through, through our platforms. Um, generally speaking, we actually serve a very broad set of, uh, of uh, users. So uh, whether those are the main OTC desks and brokers like B2C2, Genesis, Galaxy, uh, we actually currently serve uh, and uh, provide infrastructure for the majority of the lending market in crypto. Uh, companies like Celsius, Genesis Capital, Nexo, uh, Cred, BlockFi, and so on. Uh, several custodians, uh, one of them that is very well known, Prime Trust, exchanges, and uh, market makers. Now, as I go so, so through the presentation, uh, when we think about traditional uh, custodians and, and banks as they approach this space, actually very similar uh, to, uh, to, the, to what the lending market right now operates 
for uh, in, in, in the cryptocurrency market in a sense that uh, all the lending providers right now, they operate some sort of depository accounts where they provide, generate yield for, uh, for their users. And, you know, we are sort of like, you know, in a good position to talk about how that infrastructure is being set up. And uh, what you sort of realize is that if you want to really be able to um, provide services uh, in the digital asset space, you need to plug yourself into the ecosystem and not only be able to offer storage uh, for people that, as was discussed previously, that storage you need to include both cold, hot and warm uh, capabilities, but you really need to also run some key activities in, uh, from in, in terms of uh, your business. And those main activities are fairly straightforward. So usually people will run a lending desk uh, where you can actually uh, repropagate and, and sort of uh, generate yield for your customers on behalf of the assets that are being deposited. Um, you would uh, run a trading desk because people need to sell and they need to buy uh, assets uh, and they would like to use your service and uh, as we sort of as the as the market matures then uh, there is an opportunity also to enter the issuance and tokenization space in which we are not only dealing with uh, with within native uh, cryptocurrencies but basically we can actually leverage the the blockchain protocols and issue asset backed tokens whether those are stable coins uh, tokenized gold uh, tokenized security and so, and clearly, as you can as you can appreciate, with each one of those uh, um, key activities, you need to basically interact with partners and venues uh, outside of your control environment. Now, when uh, when you basically start doing it, you you run into multiple issues that uh, are in essence uh, operational and security issues. So the first one is very clear in, in the financial space is the time is money. Your ability to basically turn around uh, and lend those assets uh, and, and the ability to do it in a, in a quick fashion is sort of critical for you to generate yield, right? So essentially, if you using 100% cold storage and that cold storage takes six to 48 hours to execute a transaction out, an SLA, uh, or you relying on some kind of physical facilities where you cannot operate over weekends, or now actually with COVID, uh, you're going to have uh, some some delays. And just to give you an example, a 40 hour, 48 hour delay for on a $10 million loan, uh, you're basically losing about $5,000 of interest in, in what today is being able, you, you're able to achieve in the cryptocurrency market. Um, in addition, uh, when you basically run all those activities, uh, you really need to make sure that you have a strict control, not only how the assets are being stored, but also how the assets are being transferred. So really security at the end of the day is your reputation. And uh, you need to make sure that uh, when, you, when you send those assets, you send them in, in, within a secure environment, although they're being executed on chain. And the real challenges over there is really how to protect yourself from men in the mail attack, how to protect, protect yourself from human errors and how to sort of reduce all those ten tr test transfers and, and white list things that are being done. Um, and then the last part is, is basically being able to do all those uh, things uh, in a very compliant and uh, uh, compliant manner from an operational standpoint. Um, so one of the key things that, as was discussed, is, is basically the ability to, for example, uh, operate by AML and know your transactions and uh, interact uh, with uh, sort of the best in breed uh, tools that are out there, like chain analysis, elliptic, cipher trace, and so on. Uh, what we provide here at Fireblocks, and this is essentially what our customers are using, is basically a multi-layered capability that provides a sort of a, uh, an extremely uh, efficient infrastructure then first and for foremost gives you a secure storage uh, through the through our secure vault uh, it's actually using a, a defense in depth approach where we leverage some of the newest and and the best technology in the market including multi-part computation that removes a single point of failure and we actually uh, protecting that uh, using hardware which uh, prevents uh, both insider threat and from a compliance standpoint, uh, as a bank, really allows you to stand, although you're using actually MPC and the, and the best in breed the, uh, 
uh, cryptography out there. It also allows you to uh, be able to, to be compliant with some of the uh, standards like PCI. Um, in addition, what we are very famous for is our secure transfer environment and the Fireblocks network, which basically allows you to execute uh, settlements across a very large set of uh, players in the ecosystem. Uh, we have over 60, uh, 60 counterparties that you can operate uh, through, uh, through our network. You can also operate out, outside of our network and you can also build your own uh, private network. Uh, we have over 25 exchanges in addition to, to uh, the 60 counterparties. And you're really able to do full, full settlements, including DVP, PVP, uh, even fiat that can be moved. So it really provides end-to-end -end security around the settlement. And as we say, it's ready to race. So we already have integrations built in with folks like Chain Analysis, Elliptic, and so on. APIs, APIs that are ready for, to integrate with your core banking, web, mobile apps, and even an issuance platform through which you can tokenize, sort of mint and burn, and even stake uh, assets. Um, so this is like a quick diagram of our platform uh, that I sort of explained through which you can operate all the desks and integration and interactions. Um, as I mentioned, we've, we, we are integrated with uh, all the leading uh, top tier one, tier two, tier three uh, exchanges out there. And um, just sort of like, you know, to, to answer the question that was asked there earlier, we are uh, audited SOC2 type 2 compliant, uh, audited by Ernest and Young. We're actually reviewing, uh, we're doing multiple, year, multiple times a year penetration testing on our platform and our cryptography library is edited by NCC Group, which is the uh, most well-known group. Uh, we also insured. And um, that's pretty much it. So uh, if, you are, if you guys are interested to learn more about the platform, uh, feel free to visit uh, fireblocks.com uh, or reach out to us uh, over email uh, or any other um, uh, communication channels. Right, thank you very much, Michael. And um, we have one question in the WhatsApp group. Uh, Kay asks, um, how did you experience the growth of institutional clients demand? Um, so uh, we had, as I mentioned, as I explained, we had a very strong growth over the last uh, year of uh, going pretty much like from zero to 60 institutional clients. Uh, I think that uh, generally speaking, I'm not sure exactly uh, what, what exactly the question, but I think that uh, not only that uh, a lot of institutional clients adapted and migrated to our platform because of the efficiency and the scale that it provides, but what we're actually saying is that uh, there are more and more uh, traditional institutions that are coming into this space and uh, looking for solutions. So, um, you know, generally speaking, in, in the whole, uh, with the whole economic climate right now, uh, it feels that uh, the ecosystem is growing from an institutional standpoint. Right. Um, and maybe you can give a quick uh, roundup or a quick um, distinction between what you mean by hot and warm wallets uh, for some viewers. Yeah, sure. So uh, hot and warm wallets, they're both wallets that are generally speaking connected to the internet. And uh, the usual definition of hot wallets is that is those are wallets that are able to execute uh, uh, withdrawals uh, fully automated through APIs. And, uh, and, and warm wallets are such that you have a user in the middle, right? So basically, a user need to approve the transaction, uh, but he can approve that transaction online. So every transaction that goes out first being approved or cryptographically signed by a user. With, by the way, with MPC, it's actually sort of like you know, very convenient because uh, you can have all the operators to uh, have part of the key share and be an active participant in every transaction. So cryptographically, they're part of the, of the process uh, from an approval standpoint, but those are basically the the two distinctions of uh, um, fully automated and sort of like, you know, human intervented. Okay. Thank you for that definition, Michael. I appreciate it. And thank you for your presentation. Thank you so much. And next up we have Metico and uh, we have the VP business develop development lead, uh, Seamus Donahue. Um, and Medico offers a complete technology stack for the management of cryptocurrencies and tokens. Uh, Seamus, if you would, please. Great. Thanks very much, Nim. Um, glad to be here again. Um, as mentioned, Seamus Donahue from Metaco, and I'm, I'm going to cover off basically what we talk about uh, pro programmable governance as a, as a core, core component. 
So I think we've, you know, with the presentations you've seen so far, we've spoken about a number of the kind of overall core components. So I think there's a, obviously a, there's a there's a convergence in this space. Institutional uh, infrastructure has matured a lot in the last couple of years. Uh, we launched 2018, one of the early firms in this space, and I think there was a lot of there's a lot of differentiation there, but I think the security models and the functionality is is maturing quite a bit. Um, you know, you have the hot and cold infrastructures. Basically, you have multiple as you know, ledger integration, um, smart contract tools for managing smart contract and tokenization, secure transfers, you know, integrations, multiple deployment options, and insurance has been mentioned. You know, these are all things we deliver, and I think a lot of people in the markets deliver. But I want to drill down into one specific area. I mean, we've spoken a lot here about. Um, business processes, and we're very focused on the institutional market, primarily the banking market, and that's where we've built our built our brand and our, our market share. And I think um, what we've seen is, you know, you can lock, talk to a tier one institution, and I think a lot of them, when they looked at the looked at the digital asset space, their first first uh, you know initiation in the space was to see if they could integrate with a digitally native custodian. And then often the problem there was, you know, the approach to security is rear the round multi-sig and you basically scale the number of the M of N to increase security. But uh, as, as uh, particularly Custody just spoke about, you know, business processes are, are critical to large complex regulated firms. And you just can't, they just can't fit that into that, that, that square peg into that round hole. So one of the things that uh, we view as a, a big differentiator in the market is the ability to provide you know, dynamic risk-based uh, cryptographic secure uh, policy engine. And what this really means is you can have holistic policies per client as opposed to, I think traditionally in the market, you're talking about uh, particularly policies based on wallets. So you've got a warm wallet, a hot wallet, a, cold, a colder wallet, let's say. Um, and each of those are often basically hard-coded and immutable. And then clients send a low value transaction to the to the very highly secure wallet, which as just pointed out, probably has manual interventions. And as a result, operationally, it's very expensive to process those transactions. And you know, it's, it's complex to manage the whole framework for one client if they have multiple wallets. So what you can do if you have a, can design a dynamic risk policy engine is you can design a policy which covers all their use cases and effectively can escalate based on the particular use case. So you can have, a, a, as, as we mentioned, something like a payment that needs automated transactions, so a low volume going through your system, it can basically automate that process. You can operate at scale where you need scale. And as, let's say, flow increases and basically transaction volume over set periods also increases, you can have an automatic escalation of the approval process to potentially manual processes because obviously the risk, potential risk as a firm may define them are increasing. So they can create kind of exceptional um, processes that scale as they're required. So we've got, a, this is a typical example we see when we talk about dynamic, dynamic policy engine, whoops, sorry, um, where you may have an operation where you've got two manu manual approvals, you've got two of three of, let's say, of an a AML process, and then you've got kind of a conditional, conditional rule set that creates either an automated transaction uh, or else basically the, by whatever logic you've built, logical statement you've built in here, basically it creates a, a, a manual escalation. So this is obviously critical basically to for large FIs or any regulated firm to operate in this space. So, I mean, obviously there's building blocks when you look at this. Um, I think the way we look at it is break those down into, you know, who can submit. Basically the way we've built things is everything's based on signatures, so pub keys. Um, so everything's cryptographic and secure. Um, you can build in your, your, you have a framework to build in workflows. So this is where you have all your logical statements and we, you know, we work with many different types of banks, whether it's a global security services, whether it's a, an exchange that wants to operate basically effectively cold storage, um, private banks, retail banks, and everything in between. And they all have different potential workflows. So we, we don't define necessarily, here's the business process you need to implement. Basically, instead, we give a framework where you can build any logical statement you want, um, and it will be enforced by the process. So. Here you can build if and or conditional threshold statements. You can have single approvals, groups. It can be um, concurrent, uh, sequential. However you want to design it, it's, it's a framework for you to do that. Um, and it's cryptographic secure. And obviously, when you build that, you need to have some sort of references. So either you're referencing a, a flow, a volume, um, an external rate, uh, basically trusted sources. Your, so your oracles, they can be internal or external. Um, you need to have these basically effectively indicators to build your thresholds and to build your, your escalation and risk-based risk -based flow. So that's what we see as kind of the standard. And I think when we look in the market, there's obviously some firms are doing this on a, on a transaction basis. We can talk about uh, secure transactions. 
But I think we're all in this space because we see a much bigger shift longer term. I mean, the tokenization of, of financial markets is happening. It's happening, I think, quicker than we expected. We've obviously got companies like Facebook's Libra coming out. You know, PayPal announced this week that they're going to get, provide you know, on-ramps to crypto. They're bringing potentially 325 million users. And this space is rapidly evolving. And I think the way we look at the infrastructure needs to think bigger picture. So when we talk about this, it's not just building blocks, but we view this as a, a universal programmable governance. I mean, and what that is, is, you know, we have silo, which provides all the core infrastructure for a, a custodian. So you have custody, you know, transfers, a framework for tokenization, managing all the smart contract methods that are involved in that. Obviously settlement, um, we need all the tools, the indexers and nodes. Well, that, that's, that's silo's system, but it's, we, unlike, we find it unlikely that, you know, as firms, you think of a large, large global custodian in the traditional security space, they, they have their infrastructure, but they also use external custodians. And the key question is, how do you integrate those securely? Well, you can operate this universal program of governance around your own infrastructure. That's obviously critical, but you need to have the same sort of governance around third party integrations. And I think the typical use case we see is basically sub custodians. And, you know, as we evolve into looking at security tokens, it, you may obviously have multiple jurisdictions that you may not operate in or, or even in the traditional space, sorry, in the, in the crypto space, you may integrate third party custodians because they add features or you want diversification. So we, it, we enable you to provide all the workflow governance you ran around those integrations, which are obviously going to grow over time. Um, we've heard other things about tr interfacing with trading, trading networks, setting up your own networks. Basically, we provide the same sort of governance there so you can create that secure network. Compliance tools, the same thing. You can integrate these into all your workflows because obviously you're, as a regulated firm, these are critical functions, whether that's basically initial screening through AML or outgoing, you know, white lists, black lists, you know, FATF travel, travel rules, all these need to be integrated and they need to be able to operate at scale. They can't be manual processes. Um, and core banking, I think the way we look at this is eventually, I mean, we think about core banking integration as this is obfuscated behind core banking because that's the way banks operate. But the core banking systems are, are, are effectively legacy systems, 20, 25 years old. We've integrated to them. They're complicated. They're heavy. You know, you have simple problems that, uh, such as a lot of core banking initially will only hold, will support three decimals. So these systems were not built for this new world. And I think over time, we'll see this industry flip on its head and the, the infrastructure we're building now will be the, the top layer of the infrastructure. So your access point will be through the, something like our universal programming governance, and that will provide you your digital stack and into your fiat stack. But obviously we're seeing that fiat, fiat stack increasingly move to a tokenized kind of stable coin world as well. So. Uh, this governance, this universal governance is critical component to the building block to however that evolves. And that's why some of these boxes are grayed out because the service is now coming, but we obviously don't know where they're all going, but they're clearly going to be more in the space and you need to manage those securely. So just a quick comment about us. Uh, we're Metaco is a Swiss company. We're based in Lausanne and the French side of Switzerland, but we operate globally. We've got uh, clients in Singapore or Switzerland, Singapore, Europe, Germany in particular. We work with some of the, some of the first regulated custodians there very much focused on financial institutions. Um, and uh, our main product is Silo, which we call a digital asset operating system. And, uh, you know, we'd love, if anybody would like to find out more, happy to uh, get in contact and, uh, and, and hear about your use case and discuss basically what we could, how we could work together. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Seamus. Um, interesting to learn more about Metacro. Um, we are running a little bit quick on time, but if uh, people have questions for uh, Seamus to learn more about Metacro, uh, you can also leave them in the WhatsApp chat and uh, I'm sure you can get around to answering those a little bit later on. But I don't want to cut into the next panelist and thank you, Seamus, for that. Um, we have the Director of Client Solutions for Curve, Uri, Yuri Eden. Curve is a keyless digital asset security infrastructure that enables uh, that enables traditional financial and crypto native institutions to safely store, manage, and transfer any and all digital assets. Um, thank you, Yuri. The stage is yours. Uh, hey, thank you very much. Uh, happy to be here. Um, so the topic will be how to accelerate institutional adoption of digital assets with enterprise grade security infrastructure. Uh, and I'm Uri, I'm heading the uh, customer solution here at Curve. Uh, and just to talk about us uh, at a quick glance, um, so uh, Curve provides a full stack security infrastructure for many of the large institutional players in the space. And I think it's been worth mentioning that when we're talking about uh, institutional adoption, uh, one of our customers is Franklin Templeton, 
uh, with probably one of the biggest uh, players in the space who is tokenizing their uh, money-making fund on the Stellar Network. Uh, we also work with uh, some of the Bathbin uh, regulated uh, uh, custodians that were even gave talks here in Disrupt. And on the crypto side, we work with several large exchanges such as in custodians and OTC desk. Uh, from a regulatory and security perspective, uh, we are audited uh, and, gave our, and have our SOC to type two audit, uh, cryptography audit as well. And from an insurance and assurance kind of perspective, we partnered with Munich Re, which is uh, probably one of the biggest reinsurers in the world to give our institutional customer the assurance that their assets are secure and insured when they're transact. Um, I think when we're talking about uh, securing, securing digital assets and why some of the more traditional players out there are still a bit hesitant about uh, moving, uh, there are two key issues. One, of course, is the key itself, the private key, uh, how to secure that, uh, how to prevent uh, loss of funds from uh, cyber theft. Uh, but that's only half of the picture. I think uh, the second piece is who can transact and uh, putting parameters on that. Uh, so some uh, loss of funds, which were, I think, over $20 billion in the past decades were from CyberX, but the other can be uh, issues such as Quadriga when someone uh, disappears and there is no access to the funds at all. Uh, and I think another challenge for institutions when they uh, want to enter the market is that challenge, it's a trade-off between choosing uh, liquidity and security. Uh, in the past, they needed to choose between a hot solution or, uh, or a cold one, which was more of a hardware base. Um, and it poses a, a great uh, issue for them uh, when they want to adapt into the new markets. Uh, and so we chose to use uh, MPC, uh, as an, uh, my pre uh, predecessor uh, Michael uh, mentioned, is a way to eliminate uh, the private key from the picture. Uh, I'm not going to go into how that works, but basically for the first time there is a solution that can eliminate a single point of failure, and I think that's a critical piece for any institution who wants to go into the market, uh, not having one place where someone can go ahead and steal the funds from. Uh, so I think when we're looking what are the requirements for uh, entering uh, and custodying digital assets or even money-making funds and so forth, the first and most is security. Um, there's a single point of failure that you need to be eliminated. You want to be swift on your feet, scalable, uh, software only, uh, and still have cryptography and controls over all your assets. Uh, the second is having a flexible tech stack. Uh, so whether we're talking about a large custodian or even someone who issues uh, digital currencies, each uh, client has a completely different way they want to deploy and uh, connect to their stack. Uh, they want to understand who all the shares, who should be uh, secured, who should be having, who should have more policies and control over them, uh, when transactions should occur, and also reduce the uh, operational yeah, costs and overhead with uh, storing digital assets. And finally, I think that there is a regulatory framework uh, that people talked here before. Uh, so each geographic juris jurisdiction has a completely different uh, compliance and regulatory requirements. Uh, and those are all constantly changing as well. Uh, so where assets can be stored, the ratio between hot and cold, uh, AML rules, all of that affects how institutions uh, are uh, adopting digital assets. And they need a solution, I think, that's going to be able to cater to all those uh, requirements as well. Uh, so just about us uh, in a nutshell and what we're supplying our customers. So we're giving them a blockchain agnostic uh, technology stack uh, to be easily integrated, both from a blockchain on-ramp, meaning they will not need to understand how the blockchain itself works, uh, handling on the infrastructure, uh, management of the keys, uh, giving them enterprise control, easy integration and robust API and user interface. I uh, just want to touch points on a few topics. That, uh, first of all, in adopting digital assets, easy authorization and policies. So uh, having a robust policy engine, I think, is key, uh, both from a transaction crime perspective, uh, setting threshold, uh, KFN approvals, all of that, uh, know your transaction is very important. 
uh, also giving uh, controls over the wallet themselves, velocity controls, giving um, limitations, so daily, hourly, and so forth, but also on the signing itself. Uh, so I think what we're trying to do is completely decouple the cryptography on the signing and the cryptography on the approval process. So we're seeing a lot of our organizations who are institutions who are saying, I want someone to be part of the approval process, but I don't want them to get an actual key or a cryptographic material off of the actual blockchain assets. So how do you completely decouple those is a very key a component of what we're supplying to our customers. Uh, and lastly, on the, regula on the regulatory piece, uh, we launched a product called uh, Curve Air Gap. Uh, so as we believe that MPC is secure by itself. Uh, we want to be able to um, answer to all our customer demands and regulatory requirements. So uh, the, it was mentioned that Japan has, like, for example, a 95% ratio of assets being stored in cold. Uh, US is 80%. Um, we see that our customers want to have the same controls in place for their hot and machines and keep the security for their cold. So that's why we launched a product called AirGap to help them cater to that and, under, and use all the same policies they would on their cold machines as well as their hot machines in that place. Um, and just tying everything together to keep it on the times. Um, what we're, what the pillars that we're supplying to our customer is first of all, get, having a very, very secure uh, solution, eliminating any point of failure, uh, being always connected. Uh, I think it's very important for our customers to be all night 24 seven, especially in the digital market space, uh, being flexible and customizable. We wanna be able to cater to any organization out there uh, with any deployment model, uh, whether it's hot, cold, uh, approval mechanism, everything should be completely customizable by the customer itself, a scale from the lowest customer to the highest customer, being blockchain agnostic, uh, so you can support any asset, doesn't matter the chain that you're using, and of course, giving them insurance uh, and assurance that their assets are always completely safe and secure. Um, I think that's basically it. Uh, if you have any more questions, feel free to contact us. Um, yeah. Um, trying to adhere for the time. Great, thank you, Yuri, and thank you for uh, considering the time as well. Um, and I think we're just about up for time, but as I mentioned before, you can uh, post any questions you have for any of the five panelists in the WhatsApp group. I think, Yuri, you have a question waiting for you there just now, and uh, I'm sure they'll be quick to respond. Um, but yeah, I want to thank all the panelists for their presentations and uh, all the insight they provided.